Hi, professor and classmate. I am Ho Bin Kang, who is studying in plant immunology lab. The topic I want to present today is the importance of study of plant immunology for our future. The photo is a recent UN announcement. The United Nations has reported that the population will increase to about 10 billion by 2050. As the population grows, several problems can arise, such as water shortage, resource depletion, environmental pollution, and food problem. Among them, the food problem has been a big issue from the past. The following data are from OECD and Nonghelp Economic Research Institute, respectively. According to data released by the OECD, it can be seen that the total land available for agriculture is decreasing. Also, if you look at the data presented by the NACF, you can see that the world grain inventory rate has been decreased continuously. As you can see based on the data presented above and the two presented here, if the situation persists, you can expect it that stock will be out of stock. Therefore, it can be seen that the food problem is a very important issue and should be solved as soon as possible. To solve this problem, many scientists around the world are working on plants. There are various factors that inhibit plant growth and production. Examples of abiotic stresses are sunlight, cold, drought, and temperature. And biotic stresses include virus, bacteria, and insect. In our lab, we are working on how plants are resistant to biotic stresses and triggered an immune response. Plants can use a variety of methods to protect themselves from biotic stresses. It is largely divided into two groups, external defense and internal defense are. Examples of external defense include reinforcement of cell walls or cuticles, or blocking themselves using physical defense walls or protecting themselves by secreting toxic substance. A typical example of external defense is the treatment of pathogens that have penetrated into plants by secreting certain chemicals such as salicylic acid or alkaloid. Additionally, PTI and ETI reactions can be used to make them resistant to pathogens. In our lab, we are focusing on PTI and ETI. From now, I will explain what PTI and ETI are. Pathogens have special molecular structures we call the pampus or mampus. If the pathogen approaches the plant, the pattern recognition receptor present in the plant recognizes it, and as a result, the plant secretes ROS or antimicrobial substance that kill the pathogen. These reactions we call pattern triggered immunity. However, in order to suppress this reaction, pathogen create new weapon throughout evolution that we call effectors. The effector has a number of functions, the key of which is to suppress the plant PTI response. As a result of this, the plant becomes diseased again. This reaction is called an effector-triggered susceptibility. 
However, plants also evolve a new defense system. We call it a resistant protein. These resistant proteins can recognize effectors that have penetrated plants directly or indirectly. If the effector is recognized by a resistant protein, it does not function properly. In addition, the resistant protein transmits the signal to the downstream of the plant and ultimately a strong immune response, a hypersensitivity response, occurs within the plant. This reaction is so strong that it is caused the cell death, however, this is not caused by the disease. All of this phenomena we call effector-triggered immunity. Hub A1 is a kind of effector that it was derived from Schudemann Schringer PV Schringer 61. The first paper is describing the first discovery of Hub A1. The second paper describes that Hub A1 is recognized by a resistant protein called RPS6 which has the form TIRNBLRR, which means once Hub A1 is recognized by RPS6, an immune response can occur in plant. And lastly, this paper describes that SMN1 RPS6 is activated when the MAP kinase is broken, resulting in an immune response. Here, the authors demonstrated that throughout its experiment, Hub A1 is not directly related to RPS6. So, they conclude that some target protein would be involved in this pathway. Therefore, we drew the expected model like this. As most resistant proteins recognize effector indirectly, we think that RPS6 also will recognize Hub A1 indirectly, which means some target proteins are related to the Hub A1 are involved in this pathway. Briefly summarization, when Hub A1 enters a plant through a type 3 secretion system, it has a certain effect on the target proteins and RPS6 recognizes such a change. As a result, RPS6 will transmit signal to the downstream of a plant. Finally, plant will cause immune response. However, the target protein of Hub A1 has not been identified. Therefore, my research goal is to find the target protein of Hub A1. Now, I will tell you what experiments we are learning to find the target protein of Hub A1 in the laboratory. Various experimental techniques can be applied to find the target protein. Among them, East to Hybrid is the most representative method. East to Hybrid is the method to check the interaction between two proteins in vitro. After cloning two proteins to BD vector or AD vector respectively, you can perform this experiment in East. In general, BD and AD vectors contain the tryptophan or lucin. If the two proteins are tightly bound, the reporter gene is expressed and can grow in a medium without specific amino acids such as histidine or adenine. For this experiment, PGBT9 vector was used as a BD and PAD GAL4 was used as a AD. If you succeed your experiment, you will get the following result. TL- can be used as a control to see if the experiment went right. If two proteins are bound, they can grow in a medium without histidine, and if they bind more strongly, they can also grow in a medium containing 380, which inhibits the synthesis of histidine. 
and then to check which genes are bound to our gene, we need to go through the following steps. First, several colonies will be selected and grown on a new plate for three days. After that, we should grow it in a test tube containing TLH minus liquid for two days. And then we check whether the plasmid we picked is AD throat East Mini Prep. If this is not East Plasmid, it will not amplify when we perform PCR by using specific primer. Finally, uh, after sending the information to the sequence company, we can get the information which gene interacted with our gene. Second, CoIP can be used as a way to find the target protein. In fact, in the yeast experiment that I mentioned previously, the experiment is conducted in vitro. In order to determine whether the binding is more accurate, an experiment must be performed in vivo. The experiment method is as follows. You should transform your vectors to agrobacterium. These vectors should contain each protein what you want to know the interaction. After this, you should infiltrate our bacterium to the plant. Subsequently, the leaves of the plant are ground using an IP buffer. The resultant is placed in an e-tube containing bead and incubation is performed for a specific time. This bead has the ability to bind to a specific tag. After this, it is loaded on the SDS scale and then transferred to the membrane. Next, you can treat uh, antibody. Uh, next, you can go to the dark room and you can detect it. If the two proteins are bound, you can see the band like this. The example shown here is an experiment that hub a one interacted with EDS1. If the target protein is found throughout this experiment, we can be confirmed by using this method. Also, one of the techniques we learn in our lab is the growth curve assay. After infiltration bacteria into the plant, we can see the symptoms visually. However, everyone knows that this is not objective research. Therefore, it is necessary to explain which plants are more resistant or susceptible throughout mesometrical technique. Growth curve assay can be used for this purpose. The experiment can proceed as follows. For example, if you want to know the function of AVR RPS4 in the plant, you can use this method. First, you should infiltrate Pseudomonas DC3000 or Pseudomonas DC3000, which contained AVR RPS4 into the plant. After three days, you can collect the sample and you can place the sample in an e-tube which is containing 10 mm MgCl2. And by using grinder, you can break the samples and the ground leaves are spreading on Pseudomonas aga app medium. In general, repeat three times for one line. After three days, you can get the result like this. So by counting the colonies, you can uh, make the table like this. Also, now I am learning agro transformation method. Usually for checking the function of that gene, we should use knockout plant. And by performing complementation, we should check when they restored which result will cause. First figure explain about that when RPS6 is mutated in the plant, the plant cannot resist to hub A1. So uh, after performing the agrotransformation, 
uh, they can check RPS6 is related to the pathway of HAP A1 triggered immunity. So if I find the HAP A1 target protein, I can use this method for testing the function of that gene. Thank you to listen my presentation.